Hey everybody, it's Dr. Wood, and today we're going to talk about chapter 29 with our neurological disorders. And so some common signs and symptoms that patients can present with when they're experiencing um, issues of the uh, neurologic nature um, can be pretty wide ranging. It can go from anywhere between headaches and fever, say for instance if they have uh, say meningitis, nausea, vomiting, weakness, um, sometimes it has to do with behavior and we can see what we call altered mental status. So they can have things like um, drowsiness or um, maybe mood swings, things like that. Uh, perhaps they're starting to have hallucinations wide range of things here. So it can be sometimes difficult to actually determine what the um, issue is with the patient uh, unless you do like a pretty thorough workup for them. And so some common side effects you're going to see with medications associated with neurologic conditions include um, a lot of it tends to be things that can um, slow down sort of mentation. So you can see things where they can be very drowsy. They may be, um, you know, develop anorexia because they just don't kind of don't want to eat. Um, may develop lack of muscle coordination, which can manifest as things like ataxia, where they have sort of a difficult time walking and maybe stumbling around a little bit worsen depression, lots of different things that can come about from some of these uh, neurologic medications. So in terms of starting out with our nervous system, it's important to talk about neurotransmitters, especially when we're talking about uh, medications that affect the neurologic system. And this will become important for the behavioral stuff as well in the next chapter. And so some of the common ones you'll run into include things like acetylcholine. This is really important for our rest and digest nervous system, for the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, we'll have our catecholamines, which are typically stimulant uh, in nature, things like epinephrine and norepinephrine. That's kind of your fight or flight sort of response neurotransmitters. Uh, dopamine is a very important one. Not only is it in, uh, useful for movement, so for instance, patients that lack dopamine have a hard time initiating movement, so that's actually Parkinson's. Uh, it also is really important for the um, the reward pathway in the brain that can lead to things like addiction. So um, certain things like cocaine or heroin can stimulate dopamine in a certain part of the brain that can actually lead to addiction there. Other important neurotransmitters include serotonin, which we know to be important for things like mood, and we'll see that become uh, come up with our antidepressants in the behavioral section next chapter. And then two important ones here I'll talk about include GABA and then glutamate. And you can kind of think about them as two sides of the same coin, where GABA is going to be the major inhibitory neurotransmitter. Kind of think about if your brain was a vehicle, GABA would be the brakes on the system. And if glutamate was a part of that same vehicle, that would be like the gas pedal. So glutamate stimulatory, GABA is going to be inhibitory. And so all the role of these neurotransmitters, they're basically sending a signal from one nerve down to another nerve, right? So when you have that nerve muscle, or the, um, uh, the synapse that occurs between two nerves, typically you're going to find they're releasing these neurotransmitters as causing some sort of effect. Now what you'll find with long-term use of medications on the ner uh, central nervous system is that the brain does adapt to it over time, just like we saw with other systems, uh, to where the brain gets sort of used to this new state. And so the adaptation can be beneficial in some cases or it can be detrimental. And so you tend to find that patients, when they're uh, coming off of these medications, they may have a bit of withdrawal. Some of this may be physiological, such that they sort of need that drug around to maintain normal. Some of it may be more psychological, where they just have a, an innate need for that drug to sort of get back to what the normal baseline would be there. And so actually what you can end up finding in some cases is that um, as they're on medications for longer periods of time, the actual side effects may diminish, so it may get better for them, even though they keep the therapeutic effects. Um, and then some drugs actually have to be taken for several weeks before you even start to notice benefits. And this is an important thing to tell patients uh, because if you were to take a medication for a couple of weeks and you weren't seeing any difference there, you probably wouldn't want to keep taking it. And so we have to educate patients to say, hey, this may take, you know, three, four, five, six weeks before you even see any appreciable effect there. So it's a good counseling point. And as I mentioned, some drugs need to be tapered off without discon or when discontinuing. So for example, certain um, sedative medications, if you have that on the brain for long periods of time, the brain kind of gets used to having that sedative effect around, kind of uh, inhibiting things in general. And when you withdraw that immediately, the brain gets overstimulated and that can lead to seizures. Um, so it's important that a lot of these have to be tapered off in order to prevent some of these adverse effects from occurring. So we'll talk about analgesics first. Typically, analgesics are going to be able to relieve pain, 
without any kind of loss of consciousness. And normally pain is a, is a protective response where the body is telling you, hey, something's not right here. You need to either get away from whatever it is that's hurting you. Uh, so it's sort of a protective response there. And you'll actually find that a lot of uh, autonomic nervous system responses can occur as a response to pain. So for instance, if someone punches you in the face, that will cause a lot of pain and will also stimulate your fight or flight response system, right? And so the way this actually occurs is a lot of impulses get transmitted from these sensory nerve fibers that are de detecting the pain. It will send it up through the spinal cord and up to the brain for interpretation. The brain will then interpret what is happening. It may signal off several responses like your response to run away from whatever just punched you. Um, it can also actually uh, release things like enkephalins and endorphins to help control pain. This is sort of the body's natural opioids that helps with an analgesic sort of effect. And if you've ever heard anyone talk about what they call a runner's high, which is sort of a, a euphoric sort of feeling during a long distance running. It actually has to do with the brain releasing enkephalins and endorphins, which may be a sign that long distance running is a big source for pain and you probably shouldn't do it. So if you ever need an excuse, you can tell them that I gave you an easy out. Now, when you're looking at analgesics, there are kind of two main categories here. We've talked about some of these before, especially our non-narcotics. Um, and again, these include your salicylates, your NSAIDs, and acetaminophens, very common medications. The narcotics are gonna be things that are derivatives of opium, which come from the poppy plant. And so there are some that are very naturally occurring, sort of like heroin and morphine and codeine, whereas opiates, instead of opioids, opiates are actually synthetically produced. So when you think about things like, um, say for instance, fentanyl or buprenorphine, uh, these are opioids that are synthetically produced that actually don't bear much chemical resemblance to the poppy plant. Now, whenever taking opioids, it's very, very important to make sure you avoid taking this with other sedative medications, things like alcohol and histamines, certain types of antidepressants, um, because you're gonna find a lot of synergy there and you can see a lot of um, CNS depression where they can pass out and be difficult to arouse. They can develop respiratory depression where potentially they just stop breathing altogether. Uh, and so that can be what is uh, potentially fatal for those patients there. Also keep in mind, because pain is a very subjective sort of uh, experience, that different patients have different tolerances to pain, and thus they may need different dosages in order to effectively treat their pain. Now, typically, when using opioids, you want to use it for as short a period of time as possible because there are a lot of side effects associated with it, including physical dependence, including constipation. And so uh, we typically say that anything longer than, say, 10 days um, tends to be more of a chronic sort of pain there, uh, depending on the reason for it. And so we definitely want patients to come back and let us know if things are not uh, resolving on their own or over a short period of time there. And you will find some patients are just going to get opioids because it's the compassionate thing to do. So if you have someone who is, say, terminally ill, meaning they have a very short duration of expected time left on this world, we may give them medications in order to ease their, their pain, in order to make it more, um, uh, more, you know, increasing the quality of life, if not increasing the quantity of life for those patients. So it kind of make it a little more comfortable for them. Now, when you talk about anesthesia, anesthesia basically means uh, you know abolishing sensations, uh, making it to the brain itself. And there's two main varieties here, including general and local anesthesia. General anesthesia is what happens when you go to surgery and they put you completely to sleep. Basically, these are medications that will cut off all sensory impulses to the brain and you will become unconscious. And a lot of times you have to have um, a ventilator breathe for you. So frequently you'd be intubated in order for the physicians to put you out under general anesthesia, do whatever surgery they need to do, and then bring you back out of it. Different than that is going to be what we call local anesthesia, and so this is where typically these are numbing medications that are going to deal with um, sort of interrupting the sensation of pain by blocking neuro uh, neurons from actually sending painful signals up into the brain itself. And so if you can't feel anything, you can't feel a painful sensation there, and so it's only really going to be felt in the local area by itself. And so the reason why we use local anesthetics is because it helps us to perform a lot of medical or surgical procedures with relatively minimal or at least a uh, decreased amount of pain. Um, and so, for instance, if you come to the ER after, say, cutting open your arm with a laceration, we can give you local anesthetics, and that will numb up the area enough to where the provider can come in and then suture it up. They can sew it back together, and then uh, it prevents you from needing a lot of opioids or needing general anesthesia in order for that to occur. And so sometimes we'll do things like adding epinephrine. And what that can actually do as well is it helps with causing vasoconstriction. 
it helps the medication actually work for a little bit longer. So for instance, if you put lidocaine with epinephrine, um, not only will it make the drug last longer, it also helps to vasoconstrict, so it causes less bleeding, which means you can end up having a cleaner field and it's easier to suture for those patients or for those providers. So there's a couple ways you can do this. You can either apply the local anesthetic topically or on the surface of the skin. And so um, this can be applied to mucous membranes, to really pain, itching, or soreness. So for instance, if you've ever heard of like viscous lidocaine, that is something that can be switched around in the mouth to help with say stomatitis. Um, or you can do it as like an infiltration and injection. So you can actually inject it into an area uh, and prep it around for surgery or some sort of uh, manipulation. Uh, so for instance, we would do um, you know lidocaine injected around an area of a laceration in order to numb it up to allow for our providers to go ahead and do a suturing. Um, other cases would be if you were about to start, say for instance, an IV, you could actually uh, do a little bit of local anesthesia around the site to make it so that the patient does not feel as much pain when you actually get the IV done there. And so some typical local anesthetics, uh, you'll typically know it because it will end in the uh, term cane, that's the suffix there. And so you have lidocaine, prilocaine, tetracaine, and actually cocaine is considered the first First local anesthetic we've ever had. So a little interesting fact, um, if you ever see um, like older TV shows or movies where someone is testing to see whether cocaine is real or not, they'll oftentimes rub it on their gums. And the reason why they do that is because if they get a uh, anesthetic feeling, so basically they lose sensation in the gums itself, kind of a numbing effect, um, they'll know that it's actually cocaine because cocaine is a local anesthetic, right? Anyway, some other medications we can use include things like sedatives and hypnotics. Typically, these are used to help um, decrease CNS activity. They can be useful for lots of different things where they can help with anxiolysis, uh, meaning they can help decrease anxiety. Um, they may help to provide a nice calming effect. Um, they may help to maintain sleep and sometimes. Um, the main side effects, though, are going to be extensions of their therapeutic effects, meaning that they're going to make you sleepy, right? They can cause amnesia as well, so sort of like how alcohol uh, can cause cause sedation and potentially cause a brownout or a blackout where people will lose memories of events that occurred to them, these sedative and hypnotics can do the same thing. And so there's a couple of categories here, including the barbiturates, which include um, things like phenobarbital, secobarbital. Usually if it contains a barbital at the end, that means it's a barbiturate. And then there'll be the benzodiazepines. Um, so this will include um, things like alprazolam, which is Xanax, and can include midazolam, which is Versed. Usually LAM is going to be the, on the end of the name there. Um, and so we use benzodiazepines much more frequently nowadays because it helps to mitigate some of the side effects. And I'll show you a table of what that means in just a little bit. Now, both of these are considered controlled substances, which means that they can have a risk for causing physical dependence, meaning the patient needs to have that around to maintain homeostasis or in some cases, psychological addiction as well. So you do wanna be careful with that. Uh, make sure you're using these for as short a period of time as possible. Now to look at the sort of safety features between the benzodiazepines and the barbiturates, you can see here um, that in terms of relative safety, benzodiazepines are gonna win out every time uh, compared to the barbiturates. Um, this is actually a much older group of drugs than the benzodiazepines are. Um, you can see here much less uh, risk for causing pretty severe CNS depression, very low risk for respiratory depression. And so overall, you're gonna find this is just much safer to use uh, with your benzodiazepines. And that makes sense because we see in terms of the prescriptions that go out for these drugs, benzos are going to be uh, probably 100 to 1 between benzos and, and barbiturates. So some of the different agents that fit into our categories here, we say sedative hypnotics. We have a few that fit into this category. So for instance, we have our Z drugs like Zolpidem, Esazopaclone, and Zalepilon. Uh, basically, these are derivatives of the benzodiazepines. So they have very similar activities here, and they're good for helping someone get to sleep and potentially stay asleep throughout the night. In some cases, if you don't want to use a controlled substance like these three, you can use something like hydroxazine, which is an antihistamine that has some pretty strong sedative effects there. So another way to get around if you did not want to use a controlled substance for your patient. Uh, barbiturates, just a few to note here, things like phenobarbital. This is more oftentimes used for seizures than anything else, uh, and the things like pentobarb and secobarbital. Okay? Now, the benzodiazepines, as I mentioned, it's a very, very common group of drugs here. We use them both outpatient and inpatient. You have things like diazepam, which is Valium, alprazolam, which is Xan, Xanax, uh, clonazepam, lorazepam. Um, probably the most common ones that I use in the hospital setting uh, because they're available IV include midazolam, lorazepam, and diazepam. Um, so we get a lot of use of those drugs there in the hospital sort of setting.
Now, looking at anti-seizure medications, well, what is a seizure? Well, basically, it's this hyperexcitability of the neurons. Basically, they're firing off in an abnormal sort of pattern that causes the patient to uh, convulse in some cases, causes them to lose consciousness. Now, when you have a patient with a seizure, you got to find out why that is. So is it due to some sort of congenital defect? Is it because they're hypoxic and they don't have enough oxygen going to the brain? Could it be due to head trauma, a big tumor in the brain causing cancer, or even a lot of substances can do that. So for instance, uh, someone, in, uh, someone abusing a bunch of amphetamines can develop seizures, right? There's a whole list of drugs that can do this. And we say epilepsy, basically it's going to be this disorder that is characterized by that hyperexcitability. So if someone had, say, an amphetamine related seizure, they wouldn't have epilepsy because they had a pretty obvious cause for it. But if they had um, basically sort of a congenital defect or they had some reason why they continue to have seizures, this is what we call epilepsy there. Overall goal is going to be to try to reduce the number of seizures they have to allow them to live sort of as normal life as possible. There's a lot of varieties of seizures that are out there. There's partial, generalized, meaning sort of what parts of the brain are they going to be uh, affecting. Um, things like absent seizures. So if you ever have a patient uh, that would uh, just basically just stare off into space for a couple of seconds, kind of like that could be an absent seizure. They basically just come right back to consciousness there. So lots of varieties. And the question is, um, well, how do you treat these? Well, mainly it's going to be by doing things that try to um, make the neurons less excitable. So you try to inhibit the system. This is where GABA comes into play. A lot of the medications we're going to look at helps to enhance the effects of GABA that helps to decrease excitability of the neurons that prevents the risk for having a seizure there. Now because of that, because they're slowing down neuronal activity, you're going to see a lot of drowsiness, a lot of dizziness associated with these. And because a lot of them have a narrow therapeutic index, meaning it's likely that if you go too high with the levels, you can end up seeing uh, a lot of side effects, we like to monitor blood levels for many of them. Not all of them, but some. And so it's also important for your patients to keep records of seizures. So if you look at certain dates, times, and the length of them, that can try to give you a clue. You know, hey, if they're all occurring at nighttime and they take their medication during the daytime, maybe they need to take another dose in the evening, right? Things like that can help it out. Um, but the main reason people are going to fail therapy is usually due to noncompliance. So I have a lot of patients that will present to the pediatric ER uh, with a seizure, and you ask the parent, hey, when's the last time they took their meds? And they say, oh, well, we're from out of town, and we didn't have it, we forgot it, uh, and that's why they end up having a seizure. So pretty common story you hear with your patients. Common anti-seizure medications include things like the barbiturates and the benzodiazepines, which we've already discussed before. These are really good for sort of acute treatment of a seizure, especially benzos. We use these all the time. If someone comes into the ER with an acute seizure, we will frequently give them something like Ativan, um, IV. Uh, if they are at home having a seizure, oftentimes they're going to have what they call a diastat or a rectal uh, diazepam uh solution they can actually inject into the rectum. Usually it's another caregiver doing that uh, to help with the seizure because uh, they usually can't take anything orally mainly because they are at risk for having uh, aspiration or they may choke on anything, any liquids especially you would put in their mouth. Uh, but other common ones, you see things like phenytoin, uh, carbamazepine, valproic acid, gabapentin. All of these are very common anti-seizure medications. But I'll tell you, especially in children, the most common one I'm seeing used nowadays is called levetiracetam or Keppra. Uh, probably eight times out of ten, I see a kid who with epilepsy, they're probably going to be on Keppra because it's a very effective drug and they don't have a ton of side effects associated with it. Now switching over to another neurologic condition includes migraine headaches. And so this is usually going to be things with like a unilateral sort of presentation, the throbbing, sometimes non-throbbing, um, but they can be accompanied by pretty significant nausea, vomiting, and they tend to be pretty sensitive to noise and light. So um, do you ever see someone who's just having an awful headache and they just want to just close all the curtains, turn off any sound, anything like that, they're probably having a migraine there. And so a couple of ways we can treat this, we can either use what we call abortive treatment, which sort of like hitting the uh, the eject button on say like an airplane or something, you're trying to abort out of that situation. This helps to eliminate the pain they're feeling acutely. And this can include things like our NSAIDs or opioids, which we don't like to use these. I mean, we'll use NSAIDs for sure, but opioids we like to stay away from if we don't have to. A newer group of drugs we use are called serotonin-like medications, and I'll talk, talk about a few of those in a little bit. And then if we can, if they have recurrent migraines, try to use something with a prophylactic sort of effect, meaning it prevents a migraine from occurring in the first place. So it reduces the incidence of attacks. And so this can include things like propranolol, which is a beta blocker. And basically, uh, without getting too in the weeds with it, uh, propranolol basically prevents the blood vessels in the brain from spasming so much, which causes a lot of migraines to occur. So that's a pretty common drug of choice for that purpose.
Other things we can use for headaches include um, Fioracet and Fioranol. This is pretty common ones. Now, I don't know necessarily how effective they tend to be. Some people swear by it. Some people don't really get a lot of benefit, uh, but it usually contains either aspirin or acetaminophen, it contains caffeine, and then this is a barbiturate derivative drug called butalbital. Um, so again, varying effects you're gonna see with that. The nice thing patients can use for abortive treatment includes the triptans, which are those serotonin-like drugs I mentioned last slide. And this can include things like sumatriptan, zolmatriptan, and narotriptan. Um, nice thing about these as well is that because patients, when they present with migraines, are frequently very nauseous, they're vomiting, a lot of these either have injectable formulations, we can give this IV, or they actually have like a, a for instance, like Imitrex has a nasal spray that you can actually use uh, that will just basically is a spray right into the nose, and it works very effective for aborting those um, those um, those migraines, those patients there. Now, another treatment or another disease state you might see here is spasticity, where basically patients are having uncoordinated movements of the muscles, and typically patients can either be sort of hypospastic or hyperspastic, so either muscles are too tense or they're too loose. And so often what you see with this is more commonly, you're gonna find this loss of dexterity, they can't really perform a lot of actions that require a lot of coordination, spasms of the muscle and the increased muscle tone. Typically this is pretty, uh, pretty painful for patients. And you most often can see this with patients with multiple sclerosis or things like muscular dystrophy. And so treatments, while it does include physical therapy, a lot of the antispasmodics we'll use for this include things like baclofen, cyclobenzaprine, uh, benzodiazepines can also be used here as well. I see a lot of Valium used for these patients with um, cerebral palsy and muscular dystrophy, and then dantrolene, which is another drug. Keep in mind, most of these are gonna be very sedating as well. So you have to think about that in terms of like, what's your patient's um, normal day like? You know, Are they going to school and being really sleepy? It might be a problem for that. Um, so those are things to consider. Now, we do have medications that stimulate the CNS, and I'm sure many of you are using caffeine, at least to some degree, and that's considered a CNS stimulant, right? And basically, it can be used to counter fatigue, maybe used for some mild pain, like we saw caffeine being used for uh, migraine treatment a, a bit ago. Um, they can try to, um, you know, basically be used to help with weight loss, they can reduce appetite, lots of other uh, reasons for this. And some of them are actually able to be used to treat things like attention deficit disorders, or narcoplex, uh, narcolepsy or cataplexy, which are some sleeping disorders. So a couple ones that fit into this category, certainly caffeine, as I mentioned, um, this is something that many of you are probably using potentially right now in order to get ready for finals. Um, but we also have things like amphetamine salts and methylphenidate. These are gonna be controlled substances because they are derivatives of amphetamines. Um, we'll talk more about this in the ADHD section next chapter. Uh, we have things like fentermine, which is a very good uh, appetite suppressant. Um, also controlled substance, because you don't want people abusing this potentially. Um, and again, these are mostly controlled substances. Obviously caffeine is not, but um, because they can cause sort of a physical and psychological dependence, that's why they are controlled substances. And then actually we have a couple ones that work on a different pathway called modafinil and armodafinil. And so this is good for patients with narcolepsy to help regulate their sleep cycles. And I actually see this used a lot too for patients um, who are night shift workers. So if you're say a nurse working in the ER overnight, they oftentimes have a hard time staying awake in the middle of the night and they have a hard time going to sleep during the daytime basically because their whole circadian rhythm gets knocked out of whack, um, their melatonin's all out of whack. And so because of that, they can end up taking modafinil or armodafinil and that will actually help them to re-regulate their body such that they will stay awake at the nighttime when they need to and they'll be able to go to sleep when they get home um, in the morning. So a couple of different um, things here to talk about in terms of the autonomic nervous system. I've kind of alluded to this already, but we have basically a parasympathetic and then a sympathetic nervous system. And many of you have probably already talked about this if you've taken sort of basic uh, anatomy physiology or potentially biology. Um, basically the parasympathetic system is your feed and breed system or your rest and digest, if some people will call it that. And you'll find that acetylcholine is the most important neurotransmitter here. And it's mainly working on what we call muscarinic receptors. It'll be very important for that pathway. On the sympathetic side of things, this is your fight or flight response. And so typically these are things that help to increase energy expenditure. You'll see when your blood glucose goes up, cortisol levels are gonna go up. Um, typically it will decrease things like digestive functions because if you're in a uh, scary scenario, then you probably don't wanna worry about digesting your food so much, but you wanna be able to run away from whatever thing is aggressing you, right? Um, and so this is gonna involve a lot of norepinephrine type substances. So norepinephrine, epinephrine are gonna be the most common things associated with the sympathetic nervous system.
So looking at drugs that are affecting the cholinergic pathway are going to increase uh, peristalsis, meaning you can see things like um, you know increased digestion, you can see uh, defecation, diarrhea because of that, urination. Some of the things we'll use these drugs for include things like myasthenia gravis and glaucoma. And typically you don't want to combine these heart medications mainly because these drugs themselves can actually cause bradycardia, which can be a problem. Uh, and then anytime patients are having sort of decreased respirations, any GI distress or excessive of perspiration, that may be a reason um, for them to come back and see the provider to see they need something else or maybe adjust their doses some. Common cholinergic agents include things like acetylcholine, carbacol, edrophonium. This is a common one we use to actually test to see if patients have uh, mycidnia gravis and then neostigmine. Anticholinergic medications are basically going to be things that block the muscarinic receptors and prevent acetylcholine from activating them. And so we see these a lot as being used for antispasmodic and antisecretory actions. Now before, when we talked about antispasmodics, we were talking about the skeletal muscle, probably like patients with MS. Here we're talking about smooth muscle in the GI tract specifically. So it's preventing the smooth muscle in the GI tract from spasming. And so this is mainly going to be affecting your GI, your gastrointestinal system, and your gastro, um, uh, general urinary system, or GU tract. And so this can include things like neuromuscular blockers uh, that can cause a paralysis for spastic disorders. This can include things like um, antidotes for insecticide poisoning, certain types of insecticide. And we also use this a lot, especially things like atropine for bradycardia, AV heart block. It can actually help to speed up the heart rate. It will definitely cause mydriasis or dilation of the pupils and may be useful for, for helping uh, patients with asthma that are maybe having bronchospasms. It can actually help to loosen that smooth muscle and cause them to breathe a little bit easier. Common anticholinergic uh, agents include atropine. Again, this is a common one you'll see used, especially in ERs, to help bring up a patient's heart rate. But if you're having, say, for instance, abdominal pain, uh, abdominal cramping, some of these drugs can be very useful for that as well. Things like hyoscyamine or dicyclamine. And then for patients to have, say, for instance, urinary incontinence, you want to inhibit that system, you can give them something like oxybutynin to help decrease uh, their incontinence and be able to hold their urine a little bit better. On the sympathomimetic side, or the adrenergic agonists, these are going to be things that work a lot like the sympathetic nervous system. And basically, these either include the actual catecholamines themselves, things like norepinephrine, epinephrine, even dopamine sort of falls into this category, or non-catecholamines, sort of like cocaine and the amphetamines that I mentioned before. And basically, they're all mimicking this fight-or-flight sort of response here. And so some things we can use these drugs for, specifically the adrenergic agonists, include things like restoring cardiac rhythm, uh, so if you have like a patient who's in cardiac arrest, we can give them epinephrine to try to get their heart going again. Uh, they can elevate the blood pressure, so they can cause vasoconstriction, uh, and they help, can help to control bleeding in some cases, like we talked about with epinephrine and lidocaine previously. Now, there are a couple of different drugs that can block adrenergic receptors, sort of like how we saw anticholinergic receptors, and now we have adrenergic blocking agents. This can include things like your alpha blockers, which can be used to treat hypertension and things like benign prostatic hypertrophy. Um, usually you'll find that when you have alpha um, agonist activity or alpha activation that causes the, the prostate to constrict around the urethra causing BPH symptoms, by blocking that you can cause the prostate to actually sort of relax a little bit. Then you have the beta blockers, which we've talked about before, and these are typically used to treat hypertension. They can be used to treat tachydysrhythmias or fast heart dysrhythms, dysrhythmias uh, and angina pectoris, as we mentioned before. Common things you're going to see with these medications include things like weakness, fatigue, sedation, even hypotension can be a risk for a lot of these drugs as well. In terms of the alpha blockers, uh, three drugs that fit into this category include doxazosin, prazosin, and terazosin. Some people say terazosin, I say terazosin, doesn't really matter. And then for the beta blockers, again, we know how we can identify beta blockers by looking at the LOL at the end of the name, including labetalol, natalol, propranolol, atinolol, metoprolol, and then carvedilol. So the last thing we'll talk about here is uh, drugs used to help prevent strokes. And so this is mainly going to prevent antiplatelet activity, so preventing platelets from binding together. Now, this is going to be good for patients who have had a history of ischemic stroke, meaning they had some sort of blockage usually caused by platelets that prevented oxygenated blood from getting to the brain. This is not good for hemorrhagic strokes, where they actually had a brain bleed. Um, but basically, we can use things like aspirin for prophylaxis to try to prevent the platelets from grabbing together. And sometimes we'll use it with a combo with another drug called dipyridamol. They can be really useful for patients who have either recurrent strokes or if they have what we call transient ischemic attacks. 
sort of like uh, angina is to heart attacks, TIAs are sort of like two strokes. So sort of like many strokes that happen before the patient has sort of a full on sort of stroke symptomatology. So that's it for the myriad of neurologic drugs we have there. If you have any questions, let me know and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot.